uh, how do I say, good morning, America, good afternoon, London and Abu Dhabi, and good evening, China and Taiwan. Uh, welcome to SAWAS, right? Before we start in earnest, uh, let me guide you to the simultaneous translation that is available to you. Uh, we'll be speaking English today. So if you would prefer to listen to the event in Arabic, go down to the bottom right of your screen, look for an icon that says interpretation, click on it, and you can access Arabic interpretation there. Now in Arabic, now Belarabiya. إرشاد لمن يحب أن يستمع إلى الحوار والفعالية باللغة العربية ممكن الاستعمال الترجمة الفورية لهذه الفعالية فمن الممكن النظر إلى الشاشة على الأسفل على يدك اليمين ستجدون صورة بشكل الكرة الأرضية مكتوب تحتها interpretation من الممكن الضغط على هذه الصورة فتجدون إرشاد تعليمات إلى استعمال الترجمة الفورية العربية so, Welcome everyone uh, Today we have a Dr. Tamim uh, Sorry, a Dr. Ali bin Tamim who is the chair of Abu Dhabi Arabic Language Center, right? The Arabic Language Center of Abu Dhabi also oversees the Sheikh Zayed Book Award, right? He's here to say a few words of welcome and say a few things about the events and the Sheikh and the Sheikh Zayed Book Award. Please welcome Dr. Ali. Please, the floor is yours, Dr. Ali. Thanks. Uh, actually, it gives me... Uh, great pleasure to participate in today's panel that addresses a very important topic, the power of Arabic literature in the West and beyond. I am delighted to be among this impressive assembly of scholar and experts lead by uh, Professor Wenqin Oyang, moderating the panel. Professor Michael Copperson, our winner, of translation category of the Sheikh Zayed Book Award last year. Nafkhar uh, bihi. Robert Erwin, the Arabist author and the Middle East editor at the Times Literary Supplement, and Dr. Huda Fakhreddin, literary translator and associate professor of Arabic literature at the University of Pennsylvania. Sahiduna Bikum Hakikatan. The Abu Dhabi Arabic Language Center, ALC, aims to support the Arabic language and set general strategies for its development and advancement scholarly, educationally, culturally, and creatively through various programs and initiatives. Mainly, the ALC published. Al Merkaz, an internationally renowned open access academic journal in the field of Arabic studies, a lexicon and dictionary kalima, a leading book translation and publishing initiative in the Arabic speaking world with the aim of reviving the translation movement in the Arab world. ALC has also teamed up with the Arab World Institute in Paris to support and promote the Arabic language and enhance its position globally through promoting SIMA, Arabic language proficiency exam. We are delighted to work with the SOAS on this inspiring series of discussion and in bringing Arabic literature the global stage through the university's key networks. The collaboration with the SAWAS is the latest in the series of the partnership established by Sheikh Zayed Book Award with esteemed cultural and academic institution, which promote the award internationally 
and in his, his its reputation with the intellectual, academic, and writer around the world. Thank you very much for this intellectual gathering. I will now hand over the Professor Wen Chin Yang for what I believe will be a very stimulating discussion and look forward to a great uh, discussion. Shukran jazeelan lakum wa sananswat insha'Allah lina ta'alna. Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, for your kind words. Uh, and we welcome here, and I hope you will enjoy the event. Uh, let me now start today's event in earnest. This event is brought to you by SOAS and the Sheikh Zayed Book Award. The Sheikh Book Zayed Book Award is one of the world's leading prizes dedicated to Arabic literature and culture. Since 2006, the award has brought recognition, reward, and readership to outstanding work by authors, translators, publishers, and organizations around the world. In 2018, the award also launched a translation grant to help produce more quality Arabic books in translation outside the Arab world. SOAS is of course fam famous for its global reach and its commitment to the global South. SOAS is a world leading center in the study of the Arab world with a high profile in cultural, literary, and translation studies. There will be a series of four events in April, May, and June coinciding with the award announcements in May. In these events, we will bring together creative writers, translators, and researchers to talk about the role and place of Arabic culture and literature in today's ever increasing global connections. These events are advertised already, but you can also look them up on the SAWAS website, keyword Sheikh Zay Book Award. In today's events, which is the second of the series, we're focused on Arab literature and culture in the West and beyond. And I like to emphasize the word beyond here. Last week, we started with the idea that translators are cultural ambassadors and thought about translation, why we translate from and into which language and what and how we translate. We reflected on the choices we make in relation to genres, such as poetry, fiction, cookbooks, or philosophy, and our approach to translation and the styles we adopt. We also talked about the thrills and perils of the word of translation, the field, the market, and translation prizes, believe it or not, and of course, what translation can do to promote cultural exchange and global understanding. Today, we extend our role as culture ambassadors and look beyond translation, though not excluding it at scholarship, editorship, creative writing in both Arabic and other languages and public engagement as part of our commitment to promoting Arab literature and culture beyond the Arabic speaking world and also beyond Europe and North America. We have with us today three distinguished panelists. Let me introduce them very briefly and then we will, we will start our discussion. So we have Robert Irwin, Wave Robert, is a novelist, historian, and editor of the Middle East section of the Times Literary Supplement. His book, The Arabian Nights, A Companion, is widely known. He was one of the editors of the Didalus Books, publisher of literary fiction. He has published nine novels and 11 books, most of which are on Arabic and Islamic subjects. Michael Cooperson, please wave Michael, is a scholar and translator. He is a member of the original editorial board of the Library of Arabic Literature based in NYU Abu Dhabi. He translated Abdel Fattah Kilitos, the author, and his doubles. Last year, he received a Sheikh Zayed Book Award for his translation of the Maqamat of Al Hariri. And I can't wait to hear more about it. And then Huda Fakhreddin, wave Huda, is a scholar, editor, and poet. She has written on the continuity between classical and modern Arabic poetics, translated Arabic poetry, and published her own poetry. She is also co editor of Middle Eastern Literatures, which is a journal dedicating 
dedicated to publishing academic work, scholarly work on Middle Eastern literatures. And she's now a member of the new editorial board of the Library of Arabic Literature. So in today's event, right, we will follow an interview format. I will ask questions and I'll turn to panelists for their sort of answers and contributions or responses. We have about an hour, but we can go beyond to about 75 minutes if there is a need, right? So, um, um, and so that's sort of like, and the questions will focus on editorship, public engagement and creative writing. The penultimate questions will be on translation. Finally, if it is possible, I would like to give attention to beyond the West, right? I'm keen to go beyond the West and think about global humanities through the prism of multilingualism, translation and engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So before we go there, right? Housekeeping, right? As I said, you can access simultaneous translation interpretation if you prefer to listen to the events in Arabic, right? And please use the question and answer, right? To post your questions. I don't think you'll be able to speak to us, but if you write down your questions, right? If you access the question and answer box, we, I will be able to read them and uh, come back to you and, uh, and our panelists will be able to answer your questions. Right. More importantly, the recordings right, will be ready and will be posted on both the Sawas and Sheikh Zayed Book Award channels later. But I don't know when yet. So keep an eye out for them. Right. So let's begin. Right. Let's talk about, you know, I want to start about by talking about our aspirations as public intellectuals. Right. And I think an academic, right, someone who is employed in an academic institution, student is a person who potentially combines three roles, if not more. One is academic, and I'm thinking of those who climb up the academic ladder to become provosts, deans, head of departments, and so on and so forth. So that's one, one area of our work, to be a scholar, right? And through, as a scholar, we publish scholarly works, right? These are books and articles and book chapters and so on and so forth, and as a public intellectual, right? And many of us, many of you are creative writers, right? So let me, let me go around. I'm going to start with Robert, right? And let me ask you about why you are keen, for example, you have been keen to take on editorships of journals or newspapers, right? Or I don't know what to call Times Literary Supplement, right? Magazines, newspapers, or book series, right? Start editing book series or do translations or edit translation series, right? So there's a part that we feel that our published scholarship, right? Cannot do, right? So we do these things, at least that's from my experience. So can I start with you, Robert, tell us about your work, right? For the Times Literary Supplement or more. Um, I, Anthologies, for example, things like this. Uh, some of the language, um, never thought, um, back in the 1960s, the, the phrase public intellectual, I don't think existed. So I'm rather surprised to have found that apparently I've joined whoever the gang of public intellectuals are. Um, also, I haven't really thought of myself as an editor until you warned me that you would be asking me about editing. And I thought... Oh, blimey, yes, I have done rather a lot of editing, in fact, uh, of very different kinds. There are very different implications of the kind of work one does. And for the Times Literary Supplement, I need to be aware of what's coming out, what's new, what's theoretically important and exciting. Uh, it was helpful that I used to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair every year for about 15 years so I could see what the Americans and the French and the Germans were doing. Um, I needed to be in touch with people who could advise me who would be an expert on the Jalairid dynasty or, or the economics of Gaddafi's Libya, so I could ask them. Um, and then get in touch with the potential reviewer. And then when they come back to me with the review, the first things I have to do is to de-academicise it. That is to say, I have to remove the transliter get them to remove the transliteration 
marks the diacriticals, remove footnotes. These are not Times Literary Supplement House style. There are various other bits of Times Literary Supplement House style about numbers and quotations and so on. All that has to be sorted out. And then I have to point out to the reviewer that the average reader of the Times Literary Supplement uh, doesn't know what a madhab is or a mamluk or, or a hadith. Uh, could, could they explain or remove the expression? And um, then I'll pass it on to other editors who do some more in-house stylistic editing. Um, and then quite often I've got to deal with reviewers who, who are expecting, they've done their review, it should be in in about two weeks' time. Why isn't it? You know, in fact, it's quite normal for a review to sit around for three months or six months. Uh, it, it's not like reviewing the, uh, the Sunday Times or something like that. Um, that's one kind of reviewing, um, but there, there are other. I reviewed, I edited the New Cambridge History of Islam, Volume Four, uh, a great fact tome, and uh, that was a bit like herding cats. Very, very difficult to get people to deliver, um, but um, much less hard work. I, di I didn't have to bother too much, but I assume they would know what a math potential reader would know what a math have is or was, and you'd also be able to look it up in other volumes of the company. And in present company, I'd like to say that uh, I thought the best contribution to volume four was that of Michael Cooperson on um, um, Muslim biographies. I thought that was very good indeed. Um, then there was, there was editing, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I edited the Penguin Anthology of Classical Arabic Literature. That was tricky. It was a very tight budget. Fortunately, the Royal Asiatic Society and the Cambridge University Press were generous with um, permissions, so they were free. But uh, I, at that point, I tried my hand at translation. Uh, I did a few translations myself. There was no budget to pay for translators. And I, I learned that, yeah, I can translate from Arabic, but I'm not a born translator, and I'm <laughs> never going back to that one. Um, I've done other kinds. Oh, yes. And then there was the editing of the, the Penguin Arabian Nights. That really was more a matter of setting the project up in the first place and then getting the translator, uh, the great, late, great Malcolm Lyons, not to put in diacriticals, which had been a killer for the people setting the press, Penguin, and also a commercial put off. And, and then minimal. Um, Put, I did minimal annotation. People who want more detailed annotation will simply have to go to the French play art edition where you get a thorough identification of famous poets and caliphs and bits of uh, areas of Cairo and Baghdad and so on. It's very minimal. But, and then more recently, there's been the annotated Norton Arabian Nights where the, the editor doesn't really know much about Arabic literature or Arabic language, but is quite an intelligent commentator on the story and where it's going and how it works or doesn't work and so on. So there's editing and there's editing and there's editing. Yeah, so, so, so Robert, I mean, I feel very fortunate that my books have been reviewed in the Times Literary Supplement. Mm. And I thought, you know, that was such a good way of taking me out of the Arabic studies silo and reach a much broader audience, right? And at SOAS, so sort of like colleagues from other departments will come to me and say, oh, fantastic, I can't believe it. You got reviewed in the Times Literary Supplement, mm -hmm. right? So in a sense, you know, there's something that you're doing for us in the service of Arabic literature and culture and our disciplines that takes us beyond the academic sort of like silo. Let's, but but let me turn to Huda now because I, I, now Huda has sort of a sort of a, two roles here. One as one of the editors of Middle Eastern Literatures, which is a journal that comes out at least three times a year, and it's a lot of work. And the other one is now the Library of Arabic Literature. And I'm going to ask Michael to come up because he was one of the first generation of the editors to talk us through the vision. So let me come, come to you about taking on these huge but thankless jobs. Yeah, Huda, want to say a few things about it, about the New aspirations? Aspirations, yes, they are huge and thankless, but also extremely gratifying and rewarding because I think editing in my experience or in my mind is a form of activism. 
Mm-hmm. in our field, because going back to your introduction to this question about, you know, the very narrow paths that academics have in front of them, climbing up the, the dark and winding ladders of the academic institution, editing is a, is a way where we feel we can really actually make a difference, even if small or even if in the lives of one or two of our junior junior colleagues. So in Middle Eastern literatures, I am very honored and proud to be continuing your legacy mentioned in, in what you have built in this journal. And the new editorial board, Nora Parr, Karis Olsak, and Adam Talib and myself are committed to taking MEL as you did beyond the Euro-American Center and to support independent scholars in the, middle, in the so-called Middle East and North Africa and the global South at large, uh, and, to, um, and academics in these areas as well, and to, to place the study of the literatures of the Middle East at the center of the humanities without you know, burdening uh, Arabic or Persian or Turkish or Hebrew with the political and anthropological historical imperatives that really govern our field. And our field is a silo. It's very suffocating. Thing, really, and you feel you need to do something, and editing is one way. And then th- those are our hopes and aspirations for MEL, and we're very optimistic. With the Library of Arabic Literature, I was a longtime fan of Al Awalin, including Michael Cooperson, the, the first, uh, uh, the founding editors and the first editorial board. I, from a distance, watched what they did and I was in awe of this project. I was elated to be invited to the board. I think this is a project whose consequence and influence and contribution will only be fully recognized in the long run. This is a project, the Library of Arabic Literature, that is inviting us to participate in presenting the Arabic literary tradition as dynamic and alive. And that is a huge thing. This is something that goes against the reputation and the false image of the Arabic literary tradition as a rigid, solid institution that's archaic and that needs to be graduated away from. The Library of Arabic Literature invites us to discover the the live core of this tradition and to participate in keeping it a progress, a project that's in progress. And I've been, you know, I've learned a lot from just the first few steps that I've taken in this journey. It's humbling because most of what we do, we do collaboratively. So you work with somebody else. You have to let go of your ego when we all have those. And you learn... (laughs) from your co-translator, your co-editor, the board when they meet. And most of all, you remember to remain a student of the Arabic literary tradition. It's a vast and generous tradition that is urgently needed. We need it It, much more than it needs us. And the Library of Arabic Literature keeps reminding us of that. So that's another uh, editing journey that I'm just embarking on and very uh, hopeful and excited about. Thank you. But I'm, I'm coming to you, not Michael, because, you know, I remember, I think we attended the first meeting that Philip called us. So there were a few things that he said, we, I don't, I don't mean to sort of like the intention is not to redefine Arabic canon or literary canon, whatever, but it, it, this is not that. But the other part is really about, you know, uh, not just editing the Arabic text, but also translating the literary works in such a way that the English translation would not be, let's put it this way, academic between quotation marks, but literally and much more accessible to a wider audience. So let's talk about this vision and the wider audience. Michael. Thank you. Uh, First, I'd I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event and to greet uh, Dr. Ali bin Tamim. It's always great to see you. Um, And to also my fellow panelists, I've learned so much from all of you, and it's really an honor to appear together. Um, As you mentioned, the project, the Library of Arabic Literature project began with the idea that we would try to produce a set of adab works that would be accessible to readers outside the academic world. Uh, I remember the 
part of our mission statement says that the goal is to put works of Arabic literature into modern lucid English, which I thought, well, that's quite a challenge since many pre-modern works, well, by definition, they're not modern and some of them are deliberately not lucid. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been an adventure watching how different translators coming from very different places with very different interests have responded to that challenge. I, I'm just gonna mention the works that I happen to have served as a volume editor. Um, because I think they represent the variety of works that we've tried to include. Um, and I should say that, uh, as Professor Hoda has pointed out, we did not intend to create a second canon, right? We intended, in fact, to open up the canon. Uh, and part of, part of what's happened deliberately or otherwise is that we've, I think, shown the world how many different things are a part of that canon. So for example, um, in order, uh, I've served as volume editor on first, a saq al saq of Ahmed Faris al shadiaq translated as Leg Over Leg by Humphrey Davies. That was the easiest one because he was so good, Allah uh, I would just sit and read and be amazed. And every 20 pages or so, I'd feel obliged to make some comment, but mostly he would shoot back and say, no, no, no. And so I would withdraw my comment. And so that was an easy one. And the book, I'm very happy to say, has been read by people in all sorts of fields outside our own. I mean, we are now really looking at the beginnings of a global understanding of the 19th century. When I think of Shadyak, I think of Herman Melville. And now it's possible for people who work in American literature to put those together for themselves. Um, the second one, um, and, and the board resisted a little bit when I brought this up, uh, but I happen to know a former restaurant reviewer for the Los Angeles Times named Charles Perry, who happens to know Arabic very well. Uh, and he's been translating cookbooks uh, for quite some time. And he well, I went to him. I can't remember. I went to him. He came to me. I can't remember. But he wanted to translate an anonymous Ayyubid period cookbook called Al Wusla Il Al Habib, which came out in English as Scents and Flavors, the Banqueter Savers. Uh, and it's a recipe book. And the manuscripts have food stains on them and they're torn and so on. Uh, and he did a fantastic job. People have actually cooked from the book. And this is not what I think any of us expected when we came into this, that we would be producing cookbooks. But it turns out it's, it's probably the earliest known cookbook. Uh, if we exempt one or two very early, I think there's something in Assyrian that may be possibly a cookbook. And there's a few similar things in Roman literature. But essentially, this is perhaps the first. Um, so it's a contribution to Arabic literature, that, or to world literature made by Arabic that most people don't know about, and I certainly didn't. Um, then uh, it was Kitab Fada'il al-Arab by Ibn Qutayba, which came out as Virtues of the Arabs, translated by Sarah Savant and Peter Webb. Um, and that one is a fascinating window into relations between al-Arab and mawali the Arabs and the uh, non-Arab Muslims. Uh, because Ibn Qutayba, who is himself a non-Arab Muslim, is trying to negotiate how these people are going to fit into a world governed by Arab values. And it's, it's a fascinating read and beautifully translated. Some bits of it are incredibly hard. I didn't understand them until after I read the translation, and I'm the one supposed to be checking it. So um, that one was a real learning experience. And finally, uh, Kitab al-Siyaha of Hanna Diab, mm. uh, who is, um, uh, has been very eagerly awaited by folks in all sorts of fields because it turns out he's the guy behind the Thousand and One Nights, meaning that Galant, as we know, um, at some point ran out of stories and started finding more. And one of his sources was uh, an Aleppan who was visiting Paris at the time, who told him stories. And it so happens that Hanna Diab's stories are the ones that became the most famous later. So it's Ala Eddin, Ali Baba. Uh, so it's that sort of marginal, formerly marginal corpus that turns out to have been the most popular. And what this project has shown the world is that uh, it wasn't really Galant who made these famous. It was actually uh, Hanna Diab, uh, who turns out to have been a fantastic storyteller, as we learn from this memoir, um, which was edited by Johannes Stefan, which is an am amazing feat because it's written in 17th century Aleppan dialect uh, from beginning to end. 
uh, and translated beautifully by Ilyas Mohanna. So uh, I, I would say that, that you know, I, it is wonderful to think about what effect we can have on global audiences. But really for me, at the moment I'm sitting there working with these texts, what I'm really focused on is how much I'm learning. Uh, I've learned so much from this. Um, I, you know, I used to think that that I had some grasp of the Arabic literary tradition, and now I realize that <laughs> I'm just getting started. Um, there, there's so these books are so rich, and and I had so little idea of what was in them before I started working with them. So um, uh, I, I I just want to second what what Huda said about how this has really been a learning experience for everyone, and and I hope for others, but ultimately. Um, it's, it's, this is something that's going to happen over a long term, right? I mean, it's nice to, to have reviews in the popular press from time to time. It's nice that people are paying attention, but ultimately this is for the ages. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I know. It's, it's time will tell, right? But, you know, I mean, do, 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 are you beginning to feel some effect? Because, like, for example, Maari is, you know, um, but sort of like uh, read now outside by people who are in comparative literature and so on and so forth. But I'm not going to dwell on that, but I'm going to pick up the threat from what you said about reaching a global audience. And let's talk about that through, right? other forms of public engagement, right? Uh, Robert, I know, writes TLS for the TLS. I know Robert appears on the BBC. I know Huda writes, you know, for the non sort of academic outlets and every, uh, all of you, I believe, have published sort of with Arab Lit, right? Which is an online non-academic, and you have written for Jadaria and so on, so Bani Pali, ones of them. So m- m- can we talk about somebody sort of, or sort of like, I know I'm sort of ambitious that way. I want to reach, you know, think about global humanities, but I'm sure all of you have some dreams about that to be able to reach out, right? Somewhere, right? So can, can, we, can we come to you, Robert, about um, going on the BBC, you know, TLS, um, I was thinking rather that probably I reach most people through being translated. It's a rather passive process as far as I'm concerned. But um, I mean, the, the, the Arabian Nightmare, my first novel, um, that's, this is an Indian English language edition. It's the latest thing to appear. It's, I think, the 22nd or 24th translation. That's how I, I get my name spread about um, the Arabian Nightmare is exceptional in being translated that many times and coming out in several successive Russian and German editions, very popular there. Um, and then my book on Ibn Khaldun has been translated into several languages and um, so I think is the history of the Bahri Mamluk Sultanate. So that's how I spread it. I, I don't, don't know how much I get listened to on the radio. I, I mean, uh, I, I've done that program with... Um, Oh, of course, uh, my brain's going. Um, the, uh, Melvin Bragg? Melvin Bragg, in our time, yes. I've done several of those. Um, I've also lectured in Paris a bit at the uh, Institut, uh, from, uh, the Institut Arabe and also the Ecole des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales and, uh, in French, which was um, a pain for me, but not as painful for me as it was for them. Um, but, uh, no, I, I just... I, I, I really, obviously, I'm targeting an English audience in the first thing. I, I can't really imagine what somebody in South Africa or Hanoi would want from me, but if they want to pick it up, that's fine. Yeah, and we, we're coming back, we, we'll, we'll come to your creative writing in a moment, but let me go through sort of the panel first. Huda, what about you, Huda? Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, I, I think there's something immediate about publishing in Banipal or Arab Lit or Jadalia, you know, you don't have to wait for the six months or year. And you feel like you're engaging in a conversation that's happening in real time and reaching an audience beyond the specialists. For me, the audience I'm always thinking about is uh, uh, writers and readers in the Arab world. So I make an effort to publish in Arabic newspapers. I think it's another very important learning experience for me to be to engage with Arab with editors and Arab uh, publishers and newspapers and platforms. And for very personal reasons, I live in translation in this country, the language I speak day to day, the language I work in and write in. So it's a relief. And 
uh, don't get me wrong, there's so much to be learned from translation. It's a very satisfying intellectual endeavor, creative and critical and all of that. But there's always there's a relief about being able to write in Arabic and participate in a conversation happening over there. It's about who I think I am or still want to be. It's a very personal thing. I like to imagine that I still think and dream in Arabic and it's my first language. So that's uh, that's one of my personal goals to remain in touch with the, uh, the literary scene and the publishing scene in the Arab world. When it comes to translation, I was very surprised that the translation of my book, my first book, Metapoises in the Arabic Tradition into Arabic by Edda, which is a Saudi-based uh, publisher, received so much attention. I mean, suddenly the book, which was a Brill publication that sat on bookshelves for years and years, suddenly there were people reading it and reviewing it in Arabic newspapers. And that was that made me very happy, but also kept me on my toes. Finally, somebody's actually reading. <laughs> so I should uh, reread the book and brush up and see what I have to say about it. But so that's an audience. The beyond, as you said, I'm very much interested in the beyond. So beyond the very narrow reductive binary of Arabic or Arab and the West, breaking through to the beyond, that is something that I, that I hope we all get to do. And I think the one avenue or way to get to that is to think of our work as participating in the humanities. And again, going back to silos and ghettos and area studies, break out of that system that keeps our work on the side in some dark corner, waiting for somebody to discover us and write about us in some mainstream publication. But to, to approach our work with that attitude, that we are really at the center of the world. Each uh -huh. one of us, every text we're working on can be the center of the world and, and maybe um, create a network. Uh -huh. Michael. What about you? I mean, I, I love your translation of Kirito, and I think of Kirito as someone who has a huge reach, right? And his work, and I've been reading him extensively recently, and I think, you know, he writes in a genre that we don't talk about, this essay, right? Most of it, even his book chapters are essays, these very creatively written essays that are challenging intellectually. So I think, you know, he has a reach, but, but, sort of, but I don't want to sort of steal your thunder. So I'm going to sort of let you sort of like tell us about your dreams of being, I don't know, global. <laughs> You're muted. I have to follow up on what you said about Abdel Fattah Kalito because uh, <clears throat> I've learned a great deal from him as well. And I think one of the reasons for his success is exactly what you say. He writes in a in in an, in a, in a childlike, simple narrative style that disguises an enormous theoretical sophistication. But unlike most of us, he feels no need to show that off. He simply tells the story as simply as he can. And by the end, you have, you have discovered that the familiar figures that you thought you knew have been completely reversed in your mind. Uh, and I suppose that's something that we should all hope to be able to do, to write that clearly. Um, I think Robert does. I think Huda does. I'm not sure I have learned that yet. Um, you know, one never knows what an audience is going to, to like or to find appealing. Um, I, at one point, I wanted to remove all of the footnotes and commentaries from the Maqamat translation because I thought we wanted to get away from, this is not supposed to be an academic book. This is about the pleasure of the text. I don't want any historical, sociological, anthropological, political uh, relevance to be extracted from it at all. Uh, and then... Uh, the press said, no, 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 keep, keep those in. And so I said, okay, I always listen to the press. I've learned that they, they always know better. <laughs> and in the end, I've gotten many comments from people saying how much they enjoyed reading my boring footnotes. So there's no accounting for taste. Um, I, I've, my father tells me that um, translations of Yiddish, of, of Yiddish literature are especially popular in Japan. Um, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what he says. Uh, so you know, one never knows what people are going to like. And all one can do is, I think, do one's best, uh, write as, try to write as beautifully as Abdel Fattah Kaleto and, and uh, hope the market finds a way to your door. Uh, but on this note of community, I, 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 
I, I do think that it's one of the things that, that this work enables us to do is to find like-minded individuals on the, in other silos. Uh, I've given something like, I must be 20, 30 talks on the maqamat since, since the prize. And uh, in a way, though, the most gratifying and enjoyable experience I've had as a result of it was that I became a member of the uh, American Literary Translators Association and attended their online meeting. And it was fantastic. Uh, it was, you know, dozens of other nerds, uh, you know, all the people just like me, the fact that they work with the Chinese or German or Spanish or French or Czech or Polish. It didn't make any difference. We're all the same person, really. Um, and, and just to find them, uh, you have the feeling that some of these walls are coming down. We could all speak to each other as if we'd known each other forever. Uh, yeah. and, and that's really been a gift. So, so in a sense, what, what I'm hearing, right, from Robert to Huda to Michael is that creativity that underpins all kinds of works that we do from scholarly work, public engagement and translation is really what you think the means to reaching a global audience. So let me come to that question right now and think about the creativity in your writing, whether in Robert's fiction, right? In Michael's translation and in Huda's poetry or translation. Um, so I'm going to invite you sort of like, uh, and, and also let you have an opportunity to reach out to our audience, whether today or beyond, and our focus is beyond, through your thinking about creativity, your creative work, and what you think about when you sort of like write creatively, do you think of anything at all? And then invite you to share Right, your creative work, right? Whether Robert's fiction or who does poetry or translation, and Michael's translation of Al Hariri, for example, which I hear is very, very creative. Yeah. So, shall we start with Robert? Right, your fiction and Arabian nightmares. Well, what should I say about that? Um, I think I'm going to have to make a shocking confession that. Um, when I wrote Arabian Nightmare, I had never read The Arabian Nights. I, I'd not read it as a child. I hadn't read it as a student at School of Oriental and African Studies. Um, I spent five years teaching in St Andrews. I still hadn't read it when I started writing the novel and when I later proposed to Penguin that I wrote a guide, write a guide to The Arabian Nights. All I had read was um, a rather good book by Mia Gerhardt called The Art of Storytelling which is a study of the Arabian Nights. And she had read them all. Uh, she was Dutch, but she knew no Arabic and she used the German translation of Littmann. I, an inspiring book, and it helped inspire my novel. I still hadn't read the Arabian Nights, but I went to Penguin and said, I'd like to write a guide to the Arabian Nights. And they thought this was a very commercial prospect and they didn't want to publish my novel. They eventually did. Uh, but so got on to that. And eventually I found myself sitting in the garden, working my way through all of the Arabian Nights thing, thinking I'm sitting here in the sun reading fairy stories. Isn't this nice? Fancy getting paid for it. And after a while, oh, God, not another one of these bloody stories. I've had enough of it because it, the same kind of story cliches come round again and again and again. And, and anyway, they're not, strictly speaking, fairy stories. But yeah, so eventually I came out knowing about the Arabian Nights. And then it was a game of, um, for the guide to the Arabian Nights, of playing the stories and what they, against what I knew about Mamluk, about the history of late medieval Egypt and Syria, and have the two comment against it with each other. So, uh, unlike Mir Gerhardt, I knew a fair bit about other Arabic literature, and I knew about the times which these things were produced and the, the, the original language and particular terms that would be being used. So I was using the history to comment on the fiction and the fiction to comment on the history. And I think in the end that worked quite well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there anything you'd like to read from the Arabian Nightmares or your work? Read page and a half, the opening page and a half. Page and a half. So Tariq, I mean, this is a part that you don't have to translate. Um, I got fed up with, I got bored with teaching European history in the University of St Andrews, so I walked into the professor one day and said, I'm going back to London. 
tried to suppress a look of relief because he could now appoint somebody grander to replace me. And I went straight to the university library and I started writing this novel. For a long time, I used to go to bed early. Though the art of reading is not widespread in these parts, I confess myself to be a devotee of the practice, and in particular of reading in bed. It is peculiarly pleasant, I have found, to lie with the book propped up against the knees and feeling the lids grow heavy to drift off to sleep, to drift off in such a way that in the morning it seems unclear where the burden of the book ended and my own dreams began. A narrative of the manners and customs of some exotic people is particularly suitable for such a purpose. For a long time, too, I have meditated writing a guidebook to these parts, or a romance, a guidebook cast in the form of a romance, or a romance cast in the form of a guidebook. In any case, a narrative designed to be read in bed, the writing of a book in which the heroes and villains of the adventure should tour the territory I wish to describe will be a feat difficult, but not impossible of achievement. I no longer go to bed early, and when I do, unaccountable fears keep me awake, but as I lie in the cold and the dark, the form my narrative must take becomes clearer. The city of Alexander is relatively well known to Western travelers and readers. Cairo is different. And in the Cairo I know more than in any other place, the stranger needs a guide. For though the city's principal monuments are obvious to the eye, its diversions are transitory and less easy to find. And though the inhabitants may welcome the foreigner with a smile, beware for they're all charlatans and liars. They will cheat you if you can. I can help you there. Moreover, I shall show how a city appears not only by day, but also by night. And I wish to show how it features in the dreams and aspirations of, it, of its inhabitants. Else this guide were but a dead thing. It should be hot now, but I find it very cold. Cairo, the dragoman pointed ahead with obvious pride. Thank you, Robert. Can we turn to Huda first? And I think, Huda, you'll read in Arabic and share your English translation. And if you want to preface by saying a few things, please do. Yeah, I, when, when you asked us to prepare something, I prepared uh, an excerpt from a translation. Okay. Because you know, when Chin, I hesitate to call myself a poet. You've called me a poet three times now. Thank you very much for that. I think I you are, that. yeah. I dream of being one. I write texts that aspire to be poems, but I wouldn't call them poems. <laughs> I pretend to, to be po a poet when I translate poetry. I'm very happy doing that. So, uh, but I do have this book, if we're holding up books. This, this is the book that I'm referring to, Zamanun Sagir Tahta Shamsin Thaniya. We deliberately did not give it a genre label, not poetry, not prose. It has been referred to as memoirs, although I'm not sure. I've lived a life worthy of a memoir yet. Um, I can read an excerpt from it to show you what these texts are. Uh, maybe uh, because I wrote this book on the prose poem, I now hesitate to call it a poem. Maybe I call it poetry. What's the difference between poetry and poem? That's a conversation for a different, for another day. But I'll read, this is one of my favorite sections. It's about um, uh, running in the cemetery in West Philadelphia. So I'll read in Arabic, Tariq, you don't have to translate. Um, but then I'd like to say something about the translation if we have a minute. في حينا في غرب فيلادلفيا مقبرة سياجها حائط حجري ولها باب ولها بوابة حديدية تظل مفتوحة في كل الأوقات. في بعض الأيام بعد الشروق بقليل أربط شريط حذاء الرياضي وأنطلق نحو المقبرة أسرع في طرقات لم ترتفع العتمة عنها بعد أعبر تحت البوابة الحديدية لأركض فوق ممرات ترابية تتلوى بين القبور لست وحدي هنا آخرون غيري جاءوا يتريضون بين القبور فالمقبرة كغيرها من المساحات الخضراء شجر وعشب وتراب يتنهد أسرع في الجري لا أعرف ما إذا كنت ألحق بشيء أو أهرب منه تتثابع على جنبي الشواهد آباء أبناء أمهات أحفاد أصدقاء كلمات وأرقام مرصوفة وحيوات كاملة تسقط بين الشقوق ترتفع الشمس فأسرع أخرج من مدخل المقبرة إلى المدينة تصح متعبة 
أعود إلى البيت وصخب الموت يتبعني Something like that But where I really feel that I might strike a poetic chord is when I'm translating And one example uh, So my most recent published translation is a selection from Salim Barakat's works titled Come Take a Gentle Stab, co-translated with Jason Iwin. Uh, but that's not the one I'll read from. There's an, my white whale is Abu Tamam, and my favorite poem of all time is Abu Tamam's poem that opens with the description of spring. Mm-hmm. And when you ask me what is poetry, the first example that comes to mind are his lines on rain. غيثان فالأنواء غيث ظاهر لك وجهه والصح غيث مضمر. So I spent a lot of time retranslating and retranslating this poem. Uh, one version of, of, of it has been published in the Journal of Medieval Worlds, but I'm not happy with it. But the story I'd like to tell, and I won't take too much time, is that Abu Tammam has allowed me to rediscover poets I know very well, but in his wake, they become entirely different, and two specifically, Seamus Heaney and Philip Larkin. Okay. Reading them uh, provided me with friends, allowed me to imagine that English can open up and create a space for Abu Tamam's poems, for this poem, where he's not a stranger. And if English were a place and Abu Tamam needed somebody to show him around, it would be Seamus Heaney and Philip Larkin. And when I say that, I don't mean that there are direct quotations or references in my translation to them, but they were my companions as I imagined Abu Tamam speaking in, in English or speaking. Uh, Michael knows more than I do, finding voices for a text, many voices for a text in another language. And to my delight, I then came across Philip Larkin's amazing poem, Trees, which opens with the trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. He proved to me that he is a disciple and a student of Abu Tammam because what then comes to mind is Al-Buhtari's line, So, as if Philip, without even knowing, Philip Larkin plays the Buhturi for Abu Tammam, uh, giving me such great uh, joy and reassurance that, you know, I've, this gang, these guys are actually really friends. So I'll not say, I, yeah, I would have loved to, to read Abu Tammam's poem for you, not my translation, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, were you going to read the translation or no? Uh, I mean, there is a version published online in the Journal of Medieval, okay. Medieval Worlds. I can share that link. But, uh, okay, can you share that link later? Okay, how about Michael? Your Hariri or El Kirito? Well, first, I have to say, Hoda, that was fantastic. And I, yeah. I dispute your disavowal of being a poet. I think you've proven that you I are. I know. Um, and I could hear the echoes of, of the classics in, in your very modern poem. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I agree with you on Seamus Haney. I think that's a fantastic image of guiding Ebut Mem around the cemetery. In any case, um, so this, uh, you know, the, I think we have to respect the distinction between poetry and verse. I think what Hoda was talking about was poetry, and I think what Al Hariri produces is verse, um, which is something that I can do. I, I can't write poetry, but um, I, I can produce doggerel by the by the yard. Um, and Al Hariri isn't famous for being a poet. He's famous for performing fantastic verbal acrobatics. Um, so in, I'll, I'll just read a short uh, passage, as you may know. Well, let me read in Arabic first. So this is Abu Zaid in one of his innumerable laments of being in exile, which is a trope. It, it's, it, it's, it's a trope repeated in Arabic literature and especially in the maqamat, where it appears in almost all 50 of them. So the trick for Hariri is to say something fresh each time. That's really what I think that's about. But in a world full of refugees, I think now many of these laments take on a certain poignancy and a certain significance and dimension that they didn't have before. So here, Abu Zaid, who's been driven from home by the Crusaders, is talking about uh, living in exile. And he says, Saruju matla'u shamsi wa rab'u lahwi wa unsi. 
لكن حرمت نعيمي بها ولذة نفسي واعتظت عن اغترابا أمر يومي وأمسي ما لي مقر بأرض ولا قرار لعنسي يوما بنجد ويوما بالشام أذحي وأمسي أزجي الزمان بقوت منغس مستخسي لا أبيت وعندي فلس ومن لي بفلسي ومن يعيش مثل عيشي باع الحياة ببخسي The translation is deliberately cast into 50 different styles of English to match Al-Hariri's playing with Arabic. And in many cases, I deliberately emphasize the obscurity of many of, his, of, of many of the words he uses. In this particular case, I chose this particular maqama is translated into the uh, language of beggars, thieves, and conmen documented in an 18th century work um, by Francis Gros um, called Gros's Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue Revised and Corrected with the Addition of Numerous Slang Phrases Collected from Tried Authorities. Um, and so it's a kind of uh, thieves cant, essentially. So putting, that, putting this poem into that language resulted in the following. I was born in Saruj in Swell Street, snug as a kinchin mort, but twere slanging dues concerned that took every joy of my heart. The baggage threw me a bale of bristles and made me a knight of the road. I'm never at rest, and across the pond I've been lagged and swallowed the toad. I wear the bands and the stomach worm gnaws. Cold charity cants me my grub. Today in Damascus, tomorrow in Nejd, sleeping in the rough. Oh, bitter days all stiver cramped. Pay tip me a tester bright. I have a bill on the dam of Marib from living the flash cant life. If you didn't understand that, you're in very good company. Uh, that was the yeah. point. <laughs> but I hope. Point. Yeah. But en so enough. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to so hope that enough plain language creeps through here and there that at least the idea is clear. That was the purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sort of what I'm, guys, believe it or not, we're running out of time. It's 57 past two already, but we can go beyond a little bit because I think we have some questions. I may not be able to come to my last question, but I want to throw it out anyway, because like, from what I'm hearing, these creative, creative works, creative, even within the kind of creative works that you guys do, whether through your own composition, your own writing, Robert, I think your playful translation using multiple registers of one language, right? What, what we're seeing is, is really the, the coming together, right? Knowingly or not knowing of sort of like different literary sensibilities or different poetics, but similar sort of like literary sensibilities, right? This is what we're seeing. And in a sense, you know, you know we're lucky that we are in the US and the UK, we write in English, we communicate in English, and we have the Arabic, and these two languages take us, make us, help us to reach an audience that is beyond the US and UK or the Arab world. If you think of Arabic in India, Arabic in China, and so on and so forth. And I'm lucky enough to have Chinese as well, right? So can we sort of talk a little bit about beyond, right? Um, you know, creatively, you know, think about beyond, you know, um, and, and what are our aspirations? And we can be quick about it because I can take questions from the audience. I think I see three of them. Yeah. So, Robert, shall we start with you? Just a quick word. What, um, what are you exactly asking? Beyond. Ambitions beyond the U.S. and the Anglophone. Oh dear! Um, I always feel through translation. Yeah. Get published in English. Um, I, 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 I don't know that I really do target an international audience. Um, I'm not particularly. What I'm conscious of, though, is that um, when I started to write about Mamluk history, uh, there were three Israelis who did it. They all were slightly nutty in different ways, and quite good scholars. Though. Um, but now, my God, I'm part of an international community. And I, 
a lot of people in Chicago and surprisingly a, a lot in Japan and a lot of Japanese working on the Mamluks and a lot of Japanese working on 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 the Arabian Nights as well it, it, it's, it's it's very surprising and quite difficult to keep up with it's impossible now to keep up with Mamluk studies or, or Arabian Nights studies Arabian Nights studies has been um, when I wrote my guide it was practically the only thing around apart from Mary Gohart's book but now this, you know, there's the Encyclopedia of the Arabian Nights, and there's yeah. there yeah. are a whole school of people working on these things. Um, I'm just part of a much bigger international community, and yeah, yeah. them and trying to learn from them. Um, and I I do hope to write about the influence of the Arabian Nights on popular literature worldwide. Um, which is surprisingly worldwide and surprisingly early. You can find snatches of the Arabian Night like story elements or story episodes get as far as Iceland in the stable mm-hmm. century, things like that. It's quite amazing. Mm-hmm. I think that's what I'm Huda and then Michael, very quickly, so we can take questions. You're muted, Huda. Yes, very quickly, one of my aspirations for the beyond, and it's not a very distant beyond, very close, is Persian. So I'm interested in the study of modernism, modernism, and we're always measuring Arab modernism against French and English. But there are parallels that might be closer and much more illuminating in the Persian tradition and the Turkish tradition, but especially uh, a Persian, I mean, where the prose poem sits, where something equivalent to the Tafaila poem happens or occurs, and what are some of the collaborations and translations between Arabic and Persian? My Persian is very elementary, but but I, I'm I look forward to exploring that conversation, looking in a different direction when when examining the beginnings of ideas of modernism in the 20, 20th century, without going beyond in poetry. Very briefly. Very briefly, Michael, unmute yourself. Um, actually, Hoda Levi Thompson at Colorado is working oh, on that. I that know, but I yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, audiences outside, I, you know, the thing about the maqamat is that they're, they're they crop up everywhere. It turns out I didn't know there's a whole genre in Nigeria of writing maqamat now. Mm-hmm. Um, there has an, a new Chinese translation of, I believe it's Hamadani by, is it uh, Aileen Tian has come out. Um, and um, I've heard her work and with the maqama, the test, you don't have to know the language. You just have to hear it read aloud, right? Does it have that swing, right? And it does. I mean, so she, she read a, a bit for me uh, at Mesa one year from her phone and it was just beautiful. So um, I, I think that, you know, Arabic literature has been incredibly uh, exportable historically. And I, I think we need to just go with that. Um, and I hope that, that our project can extend into places like India and Nigeria where we haven't been translating enough. Uh, we need to start, we need to get to that. It's not just the Arab world, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's the next step, I hope. Great. Okay, questions. Are you guys ready? So we have a question from Nora Al Musa. The discussion drew my attention to the question of the Arab cultural marketability. Tastes and preferences vary and only the publishing services would offer the actual interest in numbers. Yeah? Okay, so does any anybody, and speaking of Eileen, Eileen is here with us, Eileen Chen, right? So, that, so that's question number one. What I could do is go to Eileen's question or comment. I want to make a comment that Dr. Irwin's Chinese translation of Ibn Khaldun, an intellectual biography, got eight out of 10 at Douban, right? This is okay. The Chinese version of Google Reads, a very high score for the Mamluk studies, right? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cooperson. Okay, so uh, so you, you, your book on Ibn Khaldun has been translated into Chinese and you know, Robert knows this one, knows this one. Okay, marketability, cultural marketability versus numbers versus tastes and preferences. Any comments on that? Anybody, shall I go, shall I pick on you, right? So shall we start with you, Michael? Well, I mean, we have to deal with the fact that the most popular works from our part of the world um, have thrived in English only after being 
changed substantially. So I'm thinking of Rumi, I'm thinking of the Thousand and One Nights, I'm thinking of Rubaiyat, of Omar Khayyam. I mean, there's so many examples of, of, of aggressive transculturation. And you know what? I think if it works, we should go for it. Um, because probably, you know, even if people's understanding of Rumi and Khayyam is probably quite different from that of people in Iran, uh, at least we got a foot in the door. And so I, I don't mind pandering a little bit, frankly. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I don't really know if I, I have any brilliant thoughts on marketing strategies, but, but what seems to sell right now is something that has been naturalized or transculturated to a significant extent. And we have to live with that reality and maybe even contribute to it a little bit. But if I might, may jump in. Yeah, who does? Yeah, we might not have a choice, Michael, to pander initially, because, you know, the space is very limited. You know, the quota of, of things that are translated from our languages is very little. But the next step is then to build a tradition of translation. So once you have one that is popular and read and wide, widely circulated, then that's where the real work begins to build on that and then translate or offer, present new other translations and ha try to build a tiny, slowly growing tradition of translated texts, of translations for the same text. And maybe we won't have to pander so much anymore. But that's um, aspirational, of course. Yeah, before I call on Robert, I want to abuse my position as moderator and chair, but I want to jump in and think about mistranslations and quotations, adaptations. I mean, um, these are, for me, signs of the presence of a culture in another culture, a language in another language. And I don't see why, you know, we, we need to think of these in terms of pandering, right? Because I think that's, that's what makes something from our culture equally valuable in another culture, right? So I think, you know, there was a, a Tao Te for example, in Arabic, and it's, it's misunderstood, mis, misused. But yes, it's so important. It's about the presence of Chinese in Arabic. And the same thing, and we have the other work that I was thinking of is Hay Ibn Yaqban as well, right? So that's, you know, um, all these possibilities, you know, uh, small bits of aesthetics from Arabic that goes into the aesthetics of, you know, French poetry or forget about Persian Chinese poetry. That's equally good. Huda wants to say something. Before we go to Robert, hey, that would be great if the relationship is equal. I, mean, I wouldn't worry if French is mistranslated into English as much as I would worry if Arabic were, because, I mean, there is a political, ideological misrepresentation that then is built on to to make some more dangerous generalizations and statements about Arabic and Arabic culture. So mistranslation can have more dangerous consequences in this uh, mm -hmm. relationship that is not as balanced as others. And because we are always, you know, working in resistance, uh, there's a hegemonic culture and are trying to break through. This is where mistranslations can become dangerous. dangerous. And yes, they're not only aesthetic, if had they, had they been, it would have been brilliant, but sadly, they aren't always. So before I turn to Robert, I want to say something. Uh, thanks for this wonderful meeting. This is from Tamar and Musia Shvili. Very interesting. Just wanted to mention that there is an interesting translation of Maqamat in Georgian language done by Nino Dolidze. Dol, Dol, I think you know this already, Robert. Yeah. I, I just wanted to say two things. Uh, one is that uh, translations can actually act as veils, concealing the real culture. Um, the uh, the Umar Khayyam Rubaiyat is um, such a case. It, it's a masterpiece of English literature, and we must be grateful mm -hmm. for it. But there's not a single line of that verse that can confidently be attributed to Umar Khayyam. Um, much worse is the case of the Qasido Haji Abdu, which uh, Robert, Richard Burton uh, presented as, a, as an Arabic qasida and has, and has been identified as a great work of Sufi poetry. It's no such thing. It's an extremely bad work of Victorian agnosticism. Um, terrible business. The other thing is uh, translations, translations into English, uh, and then for that matter, most West European languages, are very much a, a matter of fashion. Uh, there was a 
huge swathe of, uh, there was a kind of craze for magical realism, literature produced in Latin America and, and perhaps the Central America as well, uh, centered on Marquez and Yosa and one or two other people. And I think mm-hmm. only Borges has survived intact with his reputation fully as what it was then. And then one got the Scandinois uh, phase quite a bit later, where various Scandinavian crime things were rather grim and seems fashionable. Again, with key writers, I think what needs to happen for Arabic literature to really take off in a big way in Britain and Germany and France is for some really leading writer to, or perhaps two or three, to, to, to hit the jackpot and sort of lead the way for a lot of other writers to be translated. So it does come and go in waves. Mm-hmm. And in other languages as well. All right. I don't see any more questions. I think that's it for us. Uh, anything, any la- last words that you'd like to say? You're all fine. Okay. If that's the case, then thank you so much. All so much, Robert, Huda, and Michael for joining me today for today's event. And I thank all those who are in attendance, right? Thank you so much for coming. And thank you again. It's been fascinating talking to you. All right. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So we, we conclude the events and reminder, right? The recordings will be posted on Saras and Sheikh Zayed Book Awards YouTube channels. So thank you very much. See you guys. Inshallah soon. Thank you again.